So I was 14 years old when I made the biggest choice of my life. I got rid of my Envy phone and I went to an iPhone 1. So yes, I am an OG iPhone owner. I had the first one. I was one of 2.5 million people that got it. Um, so very, very proud of that. And so this spurred this just love with iPhones and I started getting in it. I went from that to the iPhone 3G to the iPhone 5, to the iPhone 6, and then I went to the iPhone 8. Now something big happened when I got the iPhone 8, they stopped doing upgrades. I don't know if you remember upgrades, but they stopped doing upgrades. And so I kind of now realize I had to either get a payment plan on a phone, or I had to pay a lot of money up front. And neither one sounded good to me. So I had the iPhone 8, I had it for a while, and, and every year when the new iPhone came out, my wife would kind of nudge me and say, hey, you should get the new iPhone. And I think it's more so because we kind of went back and forth. I got a new iPhone and then she got a new iPhone. So she was waiting for me to go so she could get hers. But what happened was I constantly told her every year, I said, there's not enough that's changed. There hasn't been enough that's changed for me to spend that kind of money. And so I did it. I, I, I kept going. I kept going every year. She said, hey, you should get it. I told her, no way. I'm not getting the iPhone. I'm not spending money. There's enough that changed. Well, we got to a predicament late last year and my, my battery stopped working. So my phone was either dead on the charger or about to die. And so she, she kind of really had some skin in the game. Uh, if you want to upset your wife, don't answer your phone or let it die. And so I was constantly in trouble. And I knew, okay, listen, this might be the opportunity cost. That, that is, it's, it's enough. I'm, I'm going to get the new phone. I'm going to do it. So begrudgingly, I went to the Verizon store. I got the new phone and um, I kind of waited. I waited, I didn't really do much. They transferred everything over. I went home and I got home to an empty house. And I figured, you know what? I'll take some time, I'll dig in, I'll see what's new. And I was shocked. I was shocked at how much had changed in this phone. Uh, and and I, I, couldn't, like, I couldn't find um, enough time in the day. I was taking pictures of everything. And then just as I was getting into you know, some of the new user experience stuff and, and you know, figuring out that the search bar moved from the top to the bottom, I heard the door open. And like any good dad, I sprinted to the door and I took a picture of this new camera of my daughter. And, and I was so excited to tell my wife how much it changed in this phone um, that I, I didn't even recognize that I was gonna have to tell her she was right. And so, so she was right, I got this new phone and I instantly just started, I played with it nonstop. I put my daughter to bed and I went back to my spot on the couch and I just stayed on this phone. Now I have really bad ADHD, so me sitting still for a while it is a really big feat. So I sat still for probably a few hours, looked at the phone, I, could, I couldn't get enough of it, and then I started thinking, right? So when you have ADHD, you think about everything, and you do it in three seconds. And so I started thinking, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I started thinking to myself, well, when did this happen? Like, how did I notice it? I didn't think there was notable change. And then I started thinking, well, what else am I missing? Have I missed other things that have happened? I manage, I manage a few teams. Am I missing stuff with my teams? Am I, am I missing stuff in my marriage? And I, and I was asking, I kind of went on this really, really long rabbit trail. And when I go down a path, I'm 100%. And I don't do anything else. Um, I, I've tried to become the world's best golfer. Over COVID, I tried to become a carpenter. And I do it all in like six months. I get tired and I move on to the next thing. So I got really, really just I, I obsessed over, over what have I missed? What small changes have I missed? And so I started Googling, I was looking at all these case studies, and I couldn't stop, I couldn't help myself. And so I landed on a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And it really became apparent to me that small change was a really big thing. And, and although it's not notable all the time, and although it's not noticeable all the time, it does amount to these big feats. And so for me, I kind of got into this book, you know, it's one of the few books that I didn't stop halfway through, I read the whole thing. Uh, but in chapter one, I kind of go over two things that were huge for me. And the first one is this being off by three and a half degrees. Flying from LAX to New York, if you're off by three and a half degrees at takeoff, James Clear goes on to let you know that you would end up in Washington, DC. So this is a minor change that you wouldn't even notice at, at takeoff, but you end up somewhere completely different. So I, I loved it. I, I was all in. I wanted to do more. I won't give away the whole book, but the, later in that chapter, it talks about this 1% better every day. Now, I played sports in college, I played sports my whole life, and I've heard this 1% better every day. It didn't really you know, mean much to me, but I was reading this book. The author goes on and talks about, you could be 37% better at the end of the year. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a mathematician, but I got stuck there for a while because I thought to myself, well, if you get 1% better every day, 
the end of the year, you're 365% better. And I got stuck on that. We won't go into it, but I got stuck on that. And so I kind of got really into, okay, what, what else have I missed? And then I thought back to, you know, when I took over my team, I had to change everything. I wanted to change everything. I was 25, I was getting into management for the first time, and I was gonna change the world, and I was gonna do it tomorrow. And so I was taking down pictures in the office and replacing them with different pictures, and I was just, I was just changing things to change things. And one of the things I noticed was, I didn't think my predecessor was doing that much. But I also wasn't close enough to the change to realize what was really happening. And so I kind of started seeing this theme, this reoccurring theme of not being close enough to the change, to notice it or to appreciate it. And so then I started thinking about the way I've been managed in my life. I started thinking about, you know, times where I, I was told to do this, do that, and do this, and I did. And then I was scolded because I wasn't doing it. But my manager had never asked me if I was. They never checked in. They never you know, tried to see if I was doing things. And so I knew right then and there, I had to do something. I had to do something. Uh, this couldn't be me. Uh, it's a small change needed to start with me. I needed to see it. I needed to appreciate it. And I, and I wanted to make sure I did something. So one of the things I didn't have to learn when I became a dad was being corny. I've been corny my whole life. I've leaned into it. I've embraced it. I'm fine with it. So I came up with this corny saying, this corny rule that I live my life by. Um, and, and I don't have it all figured out, but it's something that keeps me on track to notice these small changes. Because small changes are extremely ineffective on your teams, on teams within your organization, and in your own life if they're not noticed or appreciated. So I went on and I developed what I call the 10 to 1 rule. And the 10 to 1 rule is, it's really simple, it's not easy, it's a really simple rule, three rules, that it's an approach, and it's got three rules, and basically the three rules are all parts of your body. So the 10 goes for 10 toes. So 10, these are three things you can do to start appreciating and seeing, and seeing changes today. So 10 toes, being all in, being where my feet are, being present. And so for me, that's really, really hard. Um, again, as I told you, I had ADHD. I'm that guy, you walk into my office, I'm all in, I'm so excited to see you for about a minute. And then I'm like, okay, you've reached your time. And my, my computer starts dimming, I do the shimmy with the mouse, and then I see an email, and I'm answering emails and smiling, and I don't know really what's going on, the email's messed up, I don't know what you said. And so for me, I realized that I wasn't giving, I wasn't present. You know, I, when my team was talking to me, I listened, but I, I didn't always hear what was being said, um, because I wasn't there. So for me, I knew I had to be actionable, I had to, take, I had to be present, I had to be 10 toes, all in at all times. And so I started doing something that was real old school. I'm a millennial. I started taking notes on a notepad because I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a computer to distract me. That's gonna look different for everybody, but that was a way for me to be 10 toes in at all times, to be where my feet are, to be present, to really understand what was going on. So the 10 is 10 toes in. Two, two ears. So I'm not gonna go with the, the classic line, you have two ears and one mouth, you need to listen twice as much. I, my parents told me that my whole life, and I didn't listen to it when they told me then, so I'm not gonna tell you now. But one of the things that, that I've realized is, I have to listen to understand, not listen to respond. And if you're a husband, take that down and, and try to apply it. But for me, with, with always having something on my mind, I was a defensive listener. I would listen to you, but it was more of like, the white man can't jump reference when Jimi Hendrix comes on the radio. Um, I was listening to Jimmy, but I couldn't hear Jimmy, right? And so I wasn't really listening to what you were saying. I didn't really care what you were saying because I was too into what I had to say, what my response was going to be. And it, it led me down a really bad path. So listening, you can, you, can, you can talk, you can ask questions, but those two ears are vitally important that you're listening to understand. And if you're opening your mouth, it's not to defend yourself. To defend, your stance, to defend your stance, it's to make sure you really cl you, you're clear of what's going on. You're clear of where your your teammates coming from. You're clear of where your employees coming from. So we got ten toes, wiggle your toes. We got two ears, touch your ears. Now we're going to one mouth. And so the one mouth is it's, you cannot have one mouth unless you do the first two. You need to be present. You need to listen. And then when it gets to the mouth, you have to clearly communicate. And so a lot of times we follow up and we, we assume that, hey, you have a deadline next week. You, you know it's next week. I know it's next week. But I don't mention it. I, I kind of wait for you to, to fail. Clearly communicate what expectations are. 
You need to clearly communicate um, what you think is going on, where your employee may be going wrong, what they may be doing right. And with that same mouth, you need to make sure that you're appreciating your employees. Small wins need to be celebrated. If small change is gonna be effective, it needs to be celebrated. You need to have this culture of we, not me, and you can't do that if you're not saying thank you. The two most powerful words in the English vocabulary are thank you. So overuse it, use it when you don't think you need to, and remember, small change does start with you, but it needs to be appreciated and it needs to be noticed. So going back, 10 toes, 10 toes. I'm being where my feet are, I'm present, I know what's going on. Two ears, I'm listening to understand and not to respond. One mouth, I'm gonna clearly communicate and I'm going to say thank you. So, thank you.